Yeah, joining us from uh, CPET University, Ahmedabad. Thank you very much for agreeing to uh, uh, lecture at this interesting student-led forum. Uh, uh, our Professor Salil has very kindly agreed to chair this lecture. So we are thankful to him once again to, to having agreed it at such a short notice. Uh, without wasting much time, I would invite Professor Salil to take the proceeding forward. Uh, thank you, Yogesh. I am uh, very, very thankful to the students of AUD, Ambedkar University, uh, who actually reached out to Professor Trip Surut. And I'm very thankful uh, to him uh, for having accepted the invitation of our students. I want to tell my students, and I hope more, of, more and more of them will be coming, uh, that you have actually hit upon a gold mine of important ideas. And over the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to be, we are, we'll be in the hands of a scholar who's brought about a tremendous amount of complexity to historical investigation and who has given us very important insights into some of the questions which have been, uh, which have plagued me and which have intrigued uh, many of us for quite some time. Professor Surud is not really, a, he's worked a lot on Gandhi. I would not really call him a Gandhian scholar because I know he has antagonized a lot of the Gandhians with some of his uh, writings. Uh, but uh, how would I then describe him? I think I would personally be very thankful to Professor mm -hmm. Suhrud for two things. First, of course, uh, uh, he has actually enabled uh, me uh, to understand, understand certain facets of Gandhi's life in a much better way. I'm not sure that I've still fully understood them, but I just, uh, about three weeks back, I finished his wonderful introduction uh, to uh, the, the first volume of the uh, Diary of Manu Gandhi. And it's just his introduction uh, unfolded as if he was answering the kind of questions that I had in my mind about certain facets of Gandhi's life. And I repeat that I'm still not, I still haven't got all my answers, but at least an exploration, a journey has begun. So that is, uh, I, that is one thing I'm very thankful to uh, Professor Surud. And the other thing that I'm thankful to him for is that uh, he has again introduced this very important idea that Gandhi actually defies a framework. One reason why we are not fully able to understand Gandhi is that everyone tries, most of us try to understand him with the help of a kind of a framework. Gandhians created their own framework in the 50s. Marxists, after R.P. Dutt, created their own framework of understanding Gandhi. Postmodernists created their framework in which they looked primarily at Gandhi's Hindu Swaraj. We in JNU, uh, we focused on Gandhi as a strategist, primarily as a strategist, which was an important intervention, but that also became a framework. And the thing is that each framework misses out on something or the other. And each framework after a while becomes a kind of an obstacle towards a proper understanding of Gandhi. And I was, as I was reading some of the works of Professor Tridip Surud, I noticed that he actually almost, he very, very consciously uh, does not follow a framework. He may not repudiate a framework, but he very consciously does not follow a framework. And thereby he's introduced this very important idea that Gandhi actually defies a framework. Frameworks tend to come in the way these connected ideas, they take us away. They may not take us away, but they actually come in the way of a proper understanding of Gandhi, which all of us uh, want to do, historians and uh, social scientists in general. So these are the two things I'm extremely uh, thankful to him for. Uh, Professor Suhrud, I'm not going to uh, practice, I'm not going to give you, give my students a long introduction, but he has been involved in uh, preparing a critical edition of uh, Gandhi's Hindu Swaraj, his autobiography, my experiments with truth. Uh, he was involved also in a compilation of uh, this volume on the power of nonviolent resistance. At the moment, uh, Professor Suhrud is working on an eight volume compendium of the testimonies of the indigo cultivators of Champaran. So we are going to get some, uh, some, some glimpses of that uh, today. He is also involved uh, in the translation of the second volume 
of uh, the diary of uh, Manu Gandhi. So we are all waiting for those eight volumes of compendium and the second volume of the uh, diary of uh, Manu Gandhi. But finally, I'm really very, very thankful, uh, Professor Surud, that you accepted the invitation of our students. And uh, uh, over to Professor Surud. Thank you very much, uh, very generous. And thank you, thank you to the students and to Yogesh and the History Society for asking me to, to speak. I know it's been back and forth, but uh, um, circumstances have not really been very easy for most of us. What I hope to do today is not speak about Gandhi. I think I, I, I don't want to spend more than five minutes talking about M.K. Gandhi. Uh, really wish to speak about what really happened in Champaran. Uh, and what happened in Champaran, uh, Gandhi plays an important part, but what happened, the history of Champaran is not that of Gandhi what we remember of what is called the Champaran Satyagra. And, and this is something which is true of every tradition of looking at um, those events in Champaran uh, in <clears throat> April of 1917 uh, is really what is called Champaran Satyagra. And these events unfold only over three days, uh, April 17th to April 20th, 1917. What happens is um, a police sub-inspector, a man called Ayodhya Prasad, delivers a notice to Gandhi, um, who's actually at that point riding on an elephant trying to go to a village. Um, he's stopped, uh, he's put on a bell guardie, uh, he's served this notice of externment. And Gandhi goes to the district collector, Mr. Morshead, and says, I'm not going to obey this. There is a trial that takes place. Uh, it's an inconclusive trial because Gandhi admits to his guilt and says it is his duty to defy this order that he sees as a purely unjust order. Um, before the judgment could be delivered, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of, of the state of Bihar and Orissa, as it was called then, intervened, got the external uh, external notice um, reviewed the case was dropped and that's what th we think is this great satyagra in champaran um, if that were the case um, and then we are also told in passing that really it was about indigo cultivation there was a particular system of cultivation which had to do with plantation which had to do with a certain method by which indigo was cultivated that had become coercive, that had become non-profitable. And it is through Gandhi's intervention in something called the Champaran Agrarian Inquiry Commission that this system that was called the Teen Katya system, which means one third of your land being given to cultivation of indigo came to be uh, um, to be stopped. And that's really um, is how Gandhi begins to inhabit India. That's how Gandhi begins to inhabit the lives of Indian peasantry. Uh, if it were all this, uh, I don't think it would really merit um, the kind of attention it had received. But that's what we know. What happens is, is far, more, far more crucial, far more significant for history of India for history of peasant consciousness, for our understanding of agriculture, for our understanding of colonial revenue system, and our understanding of international trade, specifically in the trade of natural products, uh, and indigo being one of them. Uh, so let me start um, by giving you some background as to the cultivation of indigo in, in that part of India which is the revenue area called Champaran, which is in, um, you know, the province of Bihar. Um, before we, um, before the cultivation of indigo began in Bihar, of indigo that was done uh, in the provinces of Bengal. Uh, and we know our history of Bengal and the kind of work that has been done by his, they, 
there was an unease both within the administration and among the cultivators about the pernicious, uh, the cultivation of indigo happened. We were told by a British officer who, who was, who said not a chest of indigo left in India, which was not stained by the blood of Nilgars, um, the, the cultivators of indigo. But what was it about the cultivation of indigo and what, it, what did it do to the peasant is not something that we know from the Bengal experience because we do not have peasants speaking. We have um, British officials speaking, we have church personnel speaking, we have uh, Indian intellectuals and playwrights writing, uh, the great play Nil Darpan, uh, but we do not know what happened to the lives of uh, indigo cultivators in Bengal. Um, when the cultivation of indigo became unprofitable uh, in, in Bengal, the cultivation moved to Bihar. Uh, and Bihar really became the largest producer or one of the largest producers of indigo uh, in the world at that point. I, I'll give you some idea. Um, when, this, when we have data um, from the survey and settlement report, which was done between um, 1892 and 1897, we know that 98,000 acres of land in Champaran, one revenue division, uh, 98,000 acres of land was used for indigo cultivation. It employed 33,000 peasants in cultivation of indigo. Uh, then we know something happens in 1897. Uh, 1897 is when the German company by Seth uh, announces the invention of the synthetic dyes and uh, both the demand for natural indigo and therefore the cultivation of natural indigo begins to decline. Uh, it declines by 19, um, uh, by 1914, um, the area under cultivation is declined from about 98,000 acres to uh, roughly about 8,100 acres. Then the first world war happens again we are not trading, a part of the world is no longer trading with Germany. Uh, it's, you know, there are economic embargoes on it. And therefore the demand for the natural indigo rises again. The cultivation again goes up to about 28,000 um, acres of land in Champaran. During all these periods, um, Champaran had two kinds of land tenure systems. One kind of a land, um, really modes of land owning and cultivation in Champaran. One is called the Zirayat land, which is the land which is under the direct cultivation of landlords or the factories. And one third of land in Champaran uh, was under the Zirayat cultivation. But that means the two thirds of other land of let's say the 98,000 acres was under what came to be called uh, what we know as a, the Asamivar system which is really a ten tenant-based system uh, that you paid land revenues uh, to, to the landlord uh, and, and, and you, you got a part of the produce. Now, under the system at Champaran, the Asamiwari system had one more element to it. And that came to be called the Teen Kathya system, which means that each peasant under a legally binding contract, and this is important, it's a legally binding contract enforceable both in the revenue court as also in the judicial court, uh, recognized as such as a valid contract, under a legally valid contract was bound, bound, duty bound, to give one third of her or his land uh, for indigo cultivation to the factory. So if you had one bigha of land, uh, one third of that land was always to be earmarked for cultivation of indigo. The satta or the contract, or it was called satta in the local language, the satta also gave the right of choosing this piece of land to the factory. 
Um, so the factory therefore chose the best land every time. It also chose a different kind of land, uh, a different part of or a portion of land every year. So that's really what happened. Um, so one that you are forced to cultivate, um, you do not have a chance of to decide which part of that land would be given uh, for cultivation. And this is a legally binding contract extending over long contractual periods going up to 30 years. So in many instances, the working life of a peasant was in that sense bound to a contract. In this situation, uh, when the international market for indigo fell, um, growing of, of indigo and processing of indigo both became completely unprofitable. The factories, as they were called, um, which, which, were, which had both a processing unit and packaging units, uh, the factories decided upon a new system. And that new system was to say, we will free you of the contract. So this is seeking to free people of the contract the peasant of the contract, provided the peasant was willing to pay a certain amount to seek that freedom. Now it's the factory which is wanting to terminate the contract. It's the factory which finds the production of indigo and export of indigo unprofit. So, so you have a situ situation where, uh, it's the factory which is seeking to terminate the contract and it's seeking a price of that termination. And these contracts came to be called the Sara Beshi contracts. It's spelled as S A R A H B E S H I. Sara Beshi really meant an enhancement. So, what they were doing was to say, I will free you from the obligation to cultivate one third of your land into. into into indigo land for which you will pay me the damages or the opportunity cost, if that's the language that we wish to use, you would pay me the damages for non-cultivation of indigo that I am actually asking you to do. So it is in this context that there is a great unease in, in Champaran. Uh, uh, and, and, and the unease is manifest at various levels. Um, uh, and the uh, what we also need to understand that the, the factories were so powerful that to, to enforce the Sarabeshi agreements, you ha they had to be registered with the sub-registrar because it's a legally binding document again. Um, the government of Bihar opened up uh, offices of sub-registrar in every major factory or its outpost, as it, Thana as it was called. So it's the, the colonial administration is very much part of this entire arrangement that's taking place. And that's when the peasantry of Bihar and Champaran begins to get agitated. So, um, uh, so, uh, so the colonial administration participates in creating the Sarabeshi agreements. The peasants begin to challenge this both in the courts of law and also on ground. Uh, there, are, there are attempts at certain kinds of mobilization. Uh, there is violence reported, which is, of course, uh, um, dealt with, with the kind of firmness that you would expect the colonial administration to do in any part. Uh, it's in this context that we have the entry of M.K. Gandhi. Um, we know that from records that um, Gandhi came to know of Champaran for the first time somewhere between the 26th and the 30th uh, of December of 1916, while there is the historic Lucknow Congress taking place. And Lucknow Congress, we remember uh, for the League Congress alignment and the, and, 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 uh, the understanding that takes place. It's here that uh, uh, a peasant, uh, or who Gandhi describes as a peasant, uh, Raj, Raj Kumar Shukla from Champaran comes to Gandhi and says, 
will you please move a resolution supporting the peasants of Champaran? Gandhi, uh, being Gandhi, um, he says, well, I can't. Uh, I should not because I know nothing about Champaran. I know nothing about indigo cultivation. It's best that somebody who is in the knowledge of these things should do it. Um, in fact, the resolution then is moved by Rajkumar Shukla himself um, and is passed. But it is at the instance of Rajkumar Shukla that Gandhi would visit, agrees to visit Champaran. But much before this, this is in December of 1916, uh, we know from the colonial records that around the 12th March, on the 12th March, the local CID, um, the local um, uh, intelligence bureau, uh, files a report that one person was seen as a, at the post office wanting to send a telegram to M.K. Gandhi of South Africa fake. So it's by March 1920, certain peasants have thought that it would be prudent or wise for them to ask Gandhi to be their ally. There's also a report um, around um, the same time where the Director General of Police asked a very pointed question to the Chief Secretary of Bihar and Orissa as to what view should the government of Bihar and Orissa take on the movement of Gandhi and should he be allowed to freely speak, uh, citing the example of the state of the Punjab by saying there had been certain restrictions placed on, on the movement of Gandhi. All that happens and sometime on, um, on 10th of April, uh, 1917 is when Gandhi reaches Patna, and the next day he is in Champaran uh, area. The events th that we know as part of the Champaran history take place soon thereafter. On the 16th, he is served this notice. Uh, 18th, he appears in the court. By the 20th April, the case is withdrawn and we think that the, uh, the, the work in Champaran is over. Actually, the work in Champaran began on 16th of April. What Gandhi and six other lawyers, and these are, please understand, these are all lawyers. These are all trained lawyers, uh, not belonging to any particular political persuasion. Uh, many of them um, very prominent leaders in the area some of them members of the executive council, uh, many of, well, at least one with whom Gandhi has had a previous um, acquaintance as co-students um, of law in London. Um, so there are, there are friends and acquaintances uh, who come with him to Champaran um, and they decide, let's hear the peasants. Let's hear the peasants speak. And let's try and understand from the peasants as to what really is this condition. What is an abwab? What is Sara Beshi? Uh, what is Sara Moyan land? Uh, what is a Brit land? Uh, how does the cultivation of indigo happen? How does the measurement take place? How do the sattas operate? So if, if we need to understand what the cult situation or political economy of agriculture is, it's best that we understand it from the, from the peasants. Um, this Gandhi and Rajendra Prasad, two people who left uh, ample records for us to see, both of them mentioned that the idea of recording testimonies of peasants, and these are testimonies, uh, testimonies in the sense that each of the testimonies, it was supposed would be either signed or attested by affixing a thumbprint by the testator peasant. And at the same time, the person taking down the testimony would record his name as somebody who took down the testimony. Their idea and hope was that this would become admissible in the 
court of law as valid legal testimonies. Um, it, it is Zubani in that sense, but it's Zubani in the sense that it is something which would be recorded, which would be written down, and, and the fact of its veracity would be recorded uh, by affixing both a thumbprint or a signature of the testator and also that of the person taking down the testimony. This work uh, was to be done. Um, so you can imagine um, peasants came in very large numbers. Uh, we know that when the, when the trial took place on 18th April, uh, reports suggest of 20,000 peasants being present uh, in the town. Uh, many of them inside the court building, many of which had led to certain breakage of court furniture uh, and, and, and all of this. So large numbers of peasants are, peasant, uh, are present. Uh, and they're invited voluntarily to provide testimony. Uh, so peasants came, spoke, most of them spoke Bhojpuri, uh, a few would have spoken mightily. And the lawyer, vakil, recorder recorded the testimonies through an act of simultaneous translation in English. At the end of which the peasant put his or her thumbprint, um, left and right, depending upon whether you are male or female. Uh, and if you could sign, you signed. This work went on from about 16th of April to 13th May. So it's not a very long period. Uh, if you look at it, it's less than a month technically, uh, during which, and at that on 13th of April or 13th of May, Gandhi wrote a letter to the administration of, of Bihar and Orissa saying that here is a preliminary report. Of, of our findings uh, and, and recommendations in which he speaks of 4,000 testimonies having been recorded. Now let's pause here and ask ourselves, do we have any instance that we know of of 4,000 recorded testimonies of peasants during the colonial period, either in India or the Indian subcontinent or any other part of the world? And the answer is no. If these documents are found, read, understood, this would constitute one of the most important archives of peasantry, not only in modern India, not only under the colonial administration, but anywhere in the world during the modern period. We do not have uh, records of peasants speaking of their lives, of the conditions of agriculture, of the relationship with the state, of the nature of, of taxation regimes under which they are placed. So when, when these records come to light, this would constitute the world's largest peasant archive anywhere. And that's the significance of, of that, those testimonies. Uh, that they were taken by Gandhi and Rajendra Prasad, who played a very important role in creation of modern India, um, is, is of, of little consequence to us and should be of little consequence to us. What's important is that these were taken down by lawyers, very self-consciously so. These were done as if this is an evidence admissible in a judicial proceeding or in an administrative record. What we know, therefore, after the preliminary report is submitted, the government of Bihar and government of India, the Viceroy uh, Executive Council, decide that it was prudent to institute an official inquiry, which came to be headed by uh, uh, the commissioner of the central provinces an ICS officer, F.G. Sly, uh, uh, and it has both official members 
and one non-official member, M.K. Gandhi. Um, these testimonies and these records are presented to, we are told, to the Agrarian Inquiry Commission. The Agrarian Inquiry Commission also held various sittings across Champaran and also in Patna, gave a unanimous report, which then became the Bihar Agrarian Reform Bill of 1918, which, which basically said two things. One, that the entire, entire Teen Khatia system under which indigo was cultivated had to be abolished. One and two, there cannot be any satta, either of Sarabeshi or of cultivation of indigo going beyond a three-year period. So this entire administrative mechanism, um, the economic arrangement, a legal arrangement, uh, ownership of land, fixation of prices, all of that came to be upturned by the 1918 Agrarian Reform Bill. The crucial part really is what did the peasants say? What did the peasants say? And where do we have their testimonies? Historians of modern India, of peasantry, of the Gandhian movements, uh, of trade, of experts in indigo, have been looking for these 4,000 testimonies. Um, and how um, they came to be located, how they came to be read, um, is a story by itself. It's a fascinating story, but I am not going to go into it because it involves um, a kind of a narrative which is in the first person singular for both me and, and uh, my, my friend and colleague and collaborator, Shahid Amin. Uh, but suffice to say that it's uh, between 2009 and 2017, Shahid Amin and I came um, not only to be aware of their location, we, we came to be in possession of these testimonies. Uh, we were officially given these testimonies so that we could work on them. Uh, but the outcome of that is going to be, um, I don't know whether you can see it, it this, these, are, um, these are galley proofs of the book that's about to be, cut, to be released, which is the first volume, which is called Thumbprinted. Thumbprinted, of course, comes from the fact that majority of peasants, both men and women, put their thumb impressions at the end of each testimony. So what we have done um, is that our, our hope and aspiration is to put all these 4,000 testimonies out in the public domain with annotations, with notes, with explanatory um, segments, uh, with maps, with agrarian calendars, with conversion tables, with glossaries and indices. So the idea is that if one were to be able to go into these volumes, uh, historians of, of, of India, of trade, of agriculture, of colonial administration, of land tenures, of all the historians of what Ranjit Guha so evocatively spoke of the small voices of history, would have a very large archive, one of the largest archives in the world of peasantry to rely upon and make sense of. What I am going to do, um, having described this, I'm going to uh, end this um, narration by reading to you sections from four, four testimonies, which gives us a sense of what we are encountering and the kind of a rich archive that's open to, to historians of modern India now uh, as, as these volumes begin to, to, to get published. So I'm going to read um, the first testimony, actually, of, of a man called Lomrat Singh, uh, which is uh, who, who comes from village Jasoli. Uh, and this is recorded on, on 16th of April, 1917. What's also interesting, because these are lawyers taking it down, uh, they are very careful to, to say uh, the name of the person whose son the person is or whose wife or widow the woman is, uh, which village they are from, under which factory uh, do the lands fall, 
and if it's a zamindari under which they operate with zamindari this is so i'll give you i will read how this works it's a statement of lomraj singh son of suba singh resident of village jasoli thana keseria within the zamindari of jagira factory and i'm going to read this entire testimony um, to you um, because that's the only way one would get a sense of what's happening says my age is more than 80 years formerly i used to cultivate in nigo under the sattas which is a contract an engagement for fixed period varying from 10 to 20 years this continued up to 1320 firstly our historians of modern india know that it is emperor akbar who introduces the agrarian calendar uh, in 1555 Uh, uh which we said uh, that there would be an agrarian calendar uh and if you wanted to get it to the, the gregorian calendar you added i think 523 years no 592 or 500 or 93 years to the firstly year so this is uh, 1320 firstly in that year through the terms though the term of satta had not expired the factory stopped the cultivation of indigo Owing to the fall in prices of indigo, after 1320, firstly the factory wanted us to execute an agreement for enhancement. I refused. I kept myself completely free from Kartik, that is the month of Kartik, and Posh. In Posh, the factory management manager came to my house and took me to his factory. After reaching there, he set up his pews. They did not do anything to me out of fear of being molested. i executed an agreement and this is the agreement of sarabeshi the registrar asked <coughs> used to say go to our patwari it was thus the agreement was executed i was not willing to put my thumb impression one of my hand was caught by sahib and another by nekchand rai the ziladar and my thumb impression was taken after that the factory asked me for enhanced rent i did not pay i with others then apply to the collector that the agreement was taken forcibly but no heed was paid then we submitted a memorial near to the commissioner which was unsuccessful after that the factory instituted suit under the section 500 of ipc section 500 of ipc is defamation um we won um that in appeal um um and i had to spend rupees 9000 um in this case this is 1970 a peasant from bihar spending 9000 rupees when survey operations came to our side i put in an objection the time of attestation the sarabeshi agreement regarding the the sarabeshi land was set aside but as regards 17 bigas it was confirmed I deposited the amount in court at the previous rate. The factory instituted a suit of rent for the Sarabeshi land at the enhanced rent after our refusal to pay the enhanced rent. The khetan, which is the the record <coughs> of revenue papers, shows that the land is a Saramoyan land, which means it's a fixed. Moyan is fixed. Uh, it's 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 a fixed rent agreed uh, arrangement. this was the cause of the complaint the kothi which is the factory also got instituted a criminal case under section 107 through duni rai its mulazim against my son raghunandan singh it was struck off another criminal case to be instituted against my son through its mulazim bikhar singh under section 342 the factory afterwards withdrew the case the factory in december that year cut away the paddy from my field which was in the zarpesh ki to me under the deed dated zarpesh ki meaning uh, it's a payment so he had actually paid for that land <coughs> dated 6 september 1892 which was registered deed and this was done with the help of the police before whom the factory alleged surrender on same day a tree was cut from another field of mine on 13th march 1917 I and my son went to Motihari to attend the war loan meeting. My son stayed there, and I returned at night on 14th March, which reference to an assault on the 13th. The police sub inspector of Kesaria, with superintendent of police and five inspectors, came to my door and wanted Ragunandan. 
I said he was at Motihari. Then these people with Mr. Kemp, who's the factory manager, with 200 coolies rushed into my house. I was beating my breast in one angan while these people rushed into another and looted the, my ornaments by breaking open the boxes. One constable took away forcibly one hasuli, which is a woman's ornament, uh, uh, from one of the female members. When the superintendent of police saw this, he chastised the constable and threw it on the body of the woman. Some servant of the factory snatched away a baju, which is something which is worn on the arm, uh, from a hand of a girl. They also took away grains and damaged properties. I put in a petition before the district magistrate for guard, but of little effect. What has happened to me with regard to Sarabeshi has happened to others. That is, in others are making similar statements. Then it ends with saying, thumb impression of Lomraj Singh and the testimony taken by Babu Dharmidhar Prasad. It tells us um, that this peasant is somebody who's instituting cases, who's aware of law, who has clearly resources enough and surplus enough to spend 9,000 rupees on legal litigations. Mm -hmm. They've gone through, um, they've gone through the entire process uh, of, of filing appeals, going to the police, the revenue administration, the judicial system. Um, they have cases instituted against them. The properties are looted uh, by the factory by bringing in 200 laborers um, or mulazims of the factory and, 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 and um, um, so that's, that's part of this I'm going to read only one more way. I know that we're running out of time. Uh, um, just, just, just bear with me. Uh, this is a very interesting testimony uh, of, of um, a person called Mangra Chumar. And this talks about a different kind of uh, uh, situation, which is he's not only talking about indigo, but he's also talking about cattle hide. Uh, he is somebody who has the rights to the hide of the dead cattle. And, and, and here is a short testimony about a page. Um, let, me, um, let me read that for you, please. This is uh, Mangra Chamar, of, uh, son of Kub Bihari, aged 15 years, resident of Moza, Mankaranya, Thana Gobidganj, under the Kherwa concern. I am a Chamar by caste. My holding is in the name of Jagrut Chamar, my grandfather. I am now in possession of only two and a half bigas of land in Mankaranya and another two and a half bigas in Bolga. I corroborate the statement made by Madhurai, who, 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 who comes before him, and others as regards to the compulsory execution of Sarabeshi. My further complaint, and this is the more interesting part, my further complaint is that from, from time immemorial, it has been the custom that when any cattle died in the village, it was the duty of the members of my family to remove the dead cattle and we were entitled to its skin. We had to supply in its stead country-made shoes to my co-villagers, free of cost, and to do other sundry works for them. We have also had to pay rupees seven only per year to the Koti for this monopoly. For the past seven years, after the dead cattle is skinned by us, it is forcibly taken to the Koti. And we get nothing in return for our labors. I am told the Koti sells these skins. The Koti does not charge me rupees seven per year since it has taken the skins from us. I am in great difficulties these days as I can't supply shoes to my co-villagers, which my family had been long doing. The rent of my holding of for five bigas used to be rupees 20 only. Now I have to pay rupees 25 only according to the situation. Uh, so this is the kind of, uh, with, with what we hope that, um, at the end of this process, uh, we don't know how long it will take. The first volume should be out um, within the next month or so. Um, and and um, if we don't lose our minds and our stamina, we hope to be able to do a volume, a volume 
every year, year and a half. So over the next 10 years or so, we hope that all the eight volumes um, or nine volumes um, of testimonies would be out in the public domain with annotations. Uh, and that's really would be the real history of Champaran. But it also would be the, um, I think, the most important archive of peasantry, uh, because we do not have any such record uh, that I'm aware of uh, for modern India, for even parts of the colonial world uh, where agriculture was done through plantation economy, um, whether it be of sugarcane uh, or indigo or tobacco um, that came to be, to be done. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and let's take some questions if there are. Thank you, Tridip. This was fascinating. Uh, we are so glad to have listened to it. For me, it was personally enriching to just to even think in terms of framework, the large corpus of uh, testimonies that were, uh, uh, that were captured at the point of time. Uh, uh, I request uh, the audience to please raise their hand and you may ask your respective question. Uh, I may begin actually by also asking one uh, question from my side uh, using the prerogative here. Uh, and that is actually quite a generic question. I was just wondering uh, uh, what is it that was prompting, and I'm just curious, what is it that was prompting the recording of these testimonies? Obviously there is a, a, a generic aspect of, uh, 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 of the movement gaining ground and Gandhi and, and Gandhi's uh, interest in to recording these testimonies. But I'm just wondering from where does this practice of recording testimonies coming from? Is it really informed by a particular kind of um, uh, legal enterprise of that particular era or it is coming from uh, Gandhian experiments, uh, uh, not Gandhian, pre-Gandhian experiments uh, in that particular area. I'm just wondering what is prompting these? Uh... Yogesh, I, mean, I think what's prompting is one that these are all lawyers. Uh, and there's a particular legal training that if you want to make a certain claim, it has to be substantiated by evidence. Mm -hmm. And it has to be substantiated by evidence, which is admissible in a court of law. Mm -hmm. So there is that. But then there is Gandhi. Um, a lawyer would have said, all right, we would do a sample survey or a bad social scientist or even a good social scientist would have said, let's do a sample survey. Right. Gandhi is not somebody who believes in sample surveys. He says, let's speak to everybody, no matter how long it takes. Mm -hmm. And we would see this being repeated um, 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 over and over again during the course of the next 30 years. Uh, soon thereafter, soon after this, um, or around the same time is the Ahmedabad mill strike, which is the first major industrial action of, mod of 20th century, uh, where the mill workers go on a strike. And again, Gandhi is involved on behalf of the mill workers. And again, there's a survey done on the living conditions of the textile laborers of Ahmedabad. Mm. And the survey, uh, the first of its kind that we know of, uh, involved 97,000 households, okay. it's a household survey. It had 27 questions. Mm -hmm. What we have unfortunately now are only the question and not those forms. Mm -hmm. I hope that at some point, um, um, some lucky researcher chances upon them. Uh, mm -hmm. That would give us perhaps the greatest archive of <clears throat> right. mm -hmm. industrial workers, at the beginning of industrialization in India. Uh, um, and so Gandhi is given to doing large amounts of data collection. Mm -hmm. This is very peculiar to, to the man. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's yes, it's partly legal training. I mean, not in large measure, the legal training, but also in, in, in a great measure, uh, the way Gandhi worked, mm -hmm. uh, um, his, his need for exactitude, of his need for verification, of being not being wanting to make a false claim on behalf of a right cause. And that really leads to this enterprise. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tritip. Uh, I think two of two questions. Madhav, uh, would you want to ask it? Please go ahead. Please unmute yourself. I you'll have to allow me to hello. 
Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible, please. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that very fine and insightful lecture, Dr. Sorul. Uh, I was just wondering if there are any folk sayings in either Maithili or Bhojpuri, which are a part of these testimonies, you know, folk sayings by these peasants reflecting on their predicament. And the second connected question that I had was, uh, what about the caste composition of these peasants whose testimonies have been recorded? Thank, no. you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Madhav. Um, I, um, the answer is yes, the peasants speak in the idiom in which they do. Uh, well, sometimes what has happened is that if the test, uh, the testimony taker is very sensitive to language, uh, and they were, they, uh, they provide the saying in, in Bhojpuri in the brackets. So you will, you know, when, when these transcriptions come out, you would be able to, to go into that. Um, um, it is, uh, and on the caste question, what we have done is that, um, you know, what they have done is they provided in some instances caste, in instances community, religion of of the peasants uh, so um, we don't we have i haven't done the analysis as to who belongs to which caste but um, um, but that's really for people who begin to read the testimonies for different kinds of things to to but yes they represent every caste uh, they represent every caste uh, they represent uh, both the small holders uh, of land they represent mid-peasantry, mid and there are instances of large peasants like Lomraj Singh, who has 9,000 rupees of surplus to, to be given. So there are there are that. Um, there are Thakurs, there are Bhimhyars, uh, there are Musahars, the large numbers of, of them are, uh, are Muslims. Uh, uh, there are Dobis, there are Kurmis, there are Chamars, uh, because these are the... Uh, so, but it's really for the... Uh, uh, I mean, these are the questions that you will ask of the testimonies when you begin to read them and analyze them in ways in which we haven't. Uh, our job really has to be make the testimonies available, make them uh, readable, make them um, accessible to, to people uh, like yourselves so that you could um, do all kinds of, I mean, you know, one interesting thing that one had been doing is all the various things around Ram that they, you know, all the na names which involve the word Ram. Um, I mean, Right. And, but, you know, uh, what we've done is we've provided an index of villages uh, and under villages who came from each village. Uh, so we hope that there would be some, um, um, some local histories which could actually begin. We, what we have also done um, with, with, uh, with help of other scholars really is to retranslate. Um, this is a kind of a an exercise for ourselves um, uh, from English back into Bhojpuri. Uh, um, we've done that as, as a kind of a small exercise. It's not a large thing, but a sample is something which is provided in the first volume as saying, we think that this is how they would have spoken. Now, you know, uh, with all the riders of what, what happens over, over a century, what happens to language. But um, yes, these are very fascinating questions which would uh, open up when, be, when scholars begin to read the testimonies. Thank you, Tridip. Uh, Manish, please go ahead. Manish? You will have to... I yeah, have can, you, can you hear me? Yes. G, 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 G. Yeah, thank you, Professor Tridip. This is a very insightful lecture for your... And uh, I was a student of Shahid Amin during my master's days in Delhi University. So I I have gone through with this some of one testimony, maybe you will mention or not, but I just want to ask one simple question, uh, whether I'm not working on the peasant history. So what do you, what's the kind of difference you have seen when you are working in the state archive and looking at the testimonies there? And if you are working in the national archives and when you're looking at this peasant files of colonial uh, time. So what is the major difference in the nomenclature and how you can actually point out that particular, you know, documents when you go to these archives? This is, I want to ask. Manish, you are asking the question that we are asking, we are not asking the question that we are asking. We are not asking the question that 
तो हम कोशिश करेंगे पर उस सवाल आपको उनसे करना चाहिए वेरी सिंपली आई थिंक आर एक्सपीरियंस रियली ऑफ and see this is we are not looking at peasant records we are not looking at agrarian records in their entirety we are not we are not we are not trying to do the grierson that was done for the bihar the, you know i mean there is this uh, you know this great compendium called the um, bihar yeah. peasant life being a discursive catalog we are not doing that right uh, nor are we doing this concise encyclopedia of the north indian peasant life so our our purpose in this exercise has been very simple it is to one one it was to um find all these two then transcribe it okay. three transcribe it with as much exactitude as one can uh three uh, create annotations glossaries provide timelines so that's what we've done but um <clears throat> and i'm not somebody who spent well i've spent a considerable time working through archives Uh, uh but i have not really worked uh through state archives as much as uh, many other historians have done i'm not a historian by training it's only by inclination and self taught that i've been working through the archives but our experience of working in the archives has been um tremendous um i think the archivists um, world over and in india do the kind of service uh, to scholarship which is unimaginable and it's usually unsung um uh, the national archives as also state archives um uh, it's really about the na- about the quality of classification of the documents which allow you access uh, and create that ease of understanding of these access with digitization it's become possible to look at uh, multiple files simultaneously and make the cross connections earlier that was not the case you also learn over the years as to where under what kind of a classification would you find a certain kind of document would it be under home records would it be under judicial records would it be under you know administrative records would it be under revenue records so it's only when you spend enough time looking at various kinds of records in various places that you begin to get the classification system of each of the archives uh, um um in our country and elsewhere as also how they would have originally been filed so that's really where the trick is of 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 but now with you know massive digitization of our national records uh it's become rather easy to look at multiple records uh, simultaneously yeah i don't you. know whether i've answered your question no no thank you it's very really- thank you very much uh, manish and uh, pradeep uh, i have a student here who wants to ask a question i will just call him uh, sandeep please come uh, hello sir thank you so much for very okay. impactful thank lecture you. so yeah, uh, there is a chapter in uh, class 12th i read the indigo uh, in which uh, i read about like uh, when british official ready to compensate the money to farmer and they are like trying to uh, compensate and gandhi agreed only 25% of uh, compensation man so i i want to know that is there any other issue i know they want to break the deadlock between landlords and tenants ki like kuch to milega kyunki so that peasant can realize that we are, like we win won the uh, battle so like they can ask like more than 50% or all the because and during during the session was going on a court all all the village and their big leaders also like rajkumar sir and uh, rajinder prasad all the big leaders were there so is there any other reason that like they can ask much more than more than 20% compensation ye ek to um i'm i'm sorry um i am not aware of this particular litigation or the case that you're talking about um 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 let's understand something uh, one thing that we um, there was no case for compensation and this inquiry commission was not supposed to give either compensation to peasants or compensate them for losses so there was no this, so there was no such thing that happened so that's first okay. right so uh, so this particular part seems to be misleading uh, that's number one two what we what happens is that both tinkatya system is declared 
null and void, but more importantly for the peasants, what are called abwabs. I don't know if you can say this in Hindustan, I will say this in Hindustan. Abwab is one thing which is illegal cesses that the, the revenue administration will extract from you over and above the legal cess or revenue that you are required to pay. Now, we know for Champaran, for example, and we have an entire list of abwabs, which are illegal cesses. There are 46 kinds of illegal cesses that are described by the peasants in these testimonies. 46 kinds. The more interesting being hathiai, which means if the factory manager sahab wanted to go on a hunt and to hunt he needed an elephant, the peasants had to pay money for the upkeep of the elephant. So what happens as part of the inquiry proceedings that one becomes aware and one is able to classify all the abwabs and the agrarian inquiry bill actually makes all abwabs illegal. So the, it's not a compensation that is talked about. It is all illegal extraction that happened. Now there is no percentage discussion that's taking place. The percentage discussions which are taking place are about the Sarabeshi as to what would be an appropriate amount of Sarabeshi that a factory could charge. So that's really what, so there is some uh, muddling that has happened um, clearly in the accounting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I think like, as you said, like there's a misleading and maybe because they particularly point out like they are 25% they are asking for the compensation and- No, no, the compensation was not a question because they didn't have compensation to get compensation. The compensation was not a question. The question was two things, whether Tin Katya is legally possible, whether Sara Beshi should be done and what happens to the Abwabs. And can the term of agreement be something as long as 20 years? And the Agrarian Inquiry Commission and the bill says that Abwabs are illegal, Sarabeshi is not to be charged, the Tinkatya system is abolished, and if voluntary agreements happen, they cannot exceed a reasonable period of three years. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ji. Thank you. Manisha, aap, um, yeah, we have a question from Manisha Pal. Manisha? Yeah. Yes, Manisha, go ahead. Manisha? Okay. Any other question that you may have, please? You may raise your hand or directly unmute yourself and ask. We lost Manisha, it seems. Which is, I mean, she's on the screen, but not clearly being able to ask. Her. Hello? Uh, yes, am I audible now? Thank God. Actually, uh, I'm, I was trying to type in that kindly unmute me. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and I'm really happy to have your lecture also. I'm from the history background. I'm from JNU. I've just submitted my, not just last year, submitted my PhD. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also in Portuguese language. So I have seen that you have translated a lot many books uh, uh, in the language Gujarati and then English. The question is little, uh, um, like how do you think that Gandhi's political ideologies were successful and are relevant in today's time? I have, <laughs> it's a, uh, means I have done my MA and I, Gandhi is my one of the favorite uh, readers and I have seen your thesis also on various people, intellectual, uh, thoughts on nation. So please answer this question. And in relevant to this, I have a related question to this. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pal. I, I, you know, um, this travels well beyond what one had set out to do. But uh, to answer your question very simply, is Gandhi relevant today? I think it's a, um, it's not his burden to be relevant. Uh, let's not forget that we shot him the point blank range three times, uh, sometime in 1948. 
uh, and it's very hard for the debt to be relevant. Um, and the kind of ex expectation that we have of our ancestors to be relevant, um, I think is somewhat unfair. And I'm, I'm not giving you Fashis's answer. It is, it is uh, you know, so the idea that we need to drag people from the past uh, and say, are they relevant today? Will they be part of our future? I think these are our questions. This is not their burden. Uh, what we need to ask is, what is it that is relevant to us today? Is the quest for justice important? Is quest for certain kind of cohabitation important? Is questions of communal harmony important? Is act of violence and nonviolence are something that perturbs us? Is the question for ethics and probity in public life and is also personal life important for us? If these are the questions which are important for us, then people who strove in their time, in their lives to, to grapple with these questions would become available to us. They could be, they need not be Gandhi, they could be other people, uh, they could be from different historical periods. But really what we need to ask is not whether they are relevant, but what are the questions today that we have which perturb us? And if these are the questions which perturb us, who from the past or who, who from our present, more importantly, uh, uh, could we could become our ally in this quest? And if uh, if it's Gandhi who's our ally, well, we make him our ally. But it's not. It is our act. It is not his act. That's really what I what I would simply say. Thank you, uh, Manisha. Any other question? Please raise your hand. Madhav, please go ahead. Madhav? Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Surud, I understand that you said that it's a story for another day, but if you could just please tell us how did you chance upon these testimonies and how did you discover them? We did not, I mean, it's, it's, um, well, it's very simple. Um, um, you keep looking, and like everybody kept looking, right? Um, you, you keep looking, and everybody keeps looking. There have been many scholars who've been looking for them, uh, people who worked on Champaran, people who worked on agriculture on Indigo. Um, and, um, you know, they were right under our noses. Um, but you get to understand these things only if you've been an archivist yourself. I, um, I've created archives and I know how archivists function. They sometimes can be lazy. Um, um, and when you are faced with a large number of papers, you need to, you, you classify them as bundles. So uh, these papers were classified not as Champaran papers. These papers were not classified as peasant testimonies. These were not classified as MK Gandhi papers. These were not classified as agrarian inquiry commission papers. They were classified as bundles. And it was Shahid Bhai and I who, and largely Shahid Bhai, we, um, and since we both spent long years in archives, he more than me, uh, but I have created archives that we could understand the classificatory system. So when we got um, the National Archives, persuaded the National Archives to open things that were classified as bundles, the testimonies tumbled out. It's as simple as that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's it's very simple. You know, if you if if I'm an archivist and I'm creating a catalog of papers, at some day I get tired, and say, बहुत कागजात हैं बंडल बना देते हैं, right? और फिर एक बंडल से नौ बंडल बन जाते हैं. They remain unclassified. Mm. The, I think the reason why uh, the um, the earlier efforts were uh, um, somewhat futile and frustrating is the thing when things are classified as bundles, we don't know what the catalog is saying to us. Thank you, Tridip. Uh, interesting question, uh, Madhav. Manish, go ahead. Uh, very. Uh... Uh, again, I'm asking you one, again, the archival question, sir. Uh, do you really think we, we are lacking a peasant archive? Still, we have 
state archives and national archives as very good working they are design sourcing we have an animal also now in the process of the uh, diaries uh, papers they are digitizing and we can access to that but still we are lacking a peasant archive that should be you know help us to more and more agrarian studies in the past it's related to the colonial time manish i i don't know uh, you know archives have you know archives not contemporary archives or not when you are doing contemporary archiving practices but when you are archiving the past uh, there is a problem and the problem is that this is usually almost entirely a, a written record of some sort right? whether it comes to us as file a or file b um, it's it is a written record and since large amount large parts of the indian peasantry did not write you did not have you do not have records left behind by peasants in this instance it is an amazing story because it's an oral narrative which is then reduced to writing in the presence of the the peasant right but it is an oral testimony now before the advent of recording and before our understanding that there are histories to be done and records to be maintained of the oral narratives of the consciousness of people uh, we did not do that so you we can't create right now archives of peasantry of the past that would be um, an exercise that would be not very fulfilling uh, because we you know we are constrained by the very nature of record keeping which requires it to be a written record of some form so they would be written about there would be records of transactions of land of prices but will they narrate in the kind of graphic details that we saw the life of a peasant or a slice of a life of a peasant is not something that we can uh, be certain about thank you uh, any other question Uh, I'm still curious, actually, because there's a lot of questions which are coming on archives. I'm, I'm curious because I'm I'm wondering why is it that I can understand that legal and I understand the Gandhian involvement, but how do these testimony land in the archive? Is something that I'm no. So, so they, they, what happens is very simple. Um, these are thousands of pages, which you can imagine. Gandhi and Rajendra Prasad and others take it to the Agrarian Inquiry Commission's proceedings. The Sahibs and Mr. Gandhi look at these testimonies and they become part of the official records of the Agrarian Inquiry. So they enter the, the records. What happens is that these records are then left behind in the office of the subdivisional magistrate. So they could have either gone, they could have gone to three places. Either the records could have remained in the office of the subdivisional magistrate in Champaran or Motihari. They could have gone to Patna and therefore would have become part of the Patna record, agrarian uh, revenue records, or they could have traveled to, to the capital in Delhi. But since this was a local inquiry, a subdivisional inquiry, the papers stayed in in Champaran, till um, and and you should know that in some time in 1950s, the Bihar government um, um, created a um, uh, created um, um, one person um, the, the amazing B B Mishra's uh, volume called the official records of the documents related to Gandhi's uh, Satyagraha in Champaran, uh, even. Even B.B. Mishra, who gives us the entire set of official records, has no access to the agrarian, um, the peasant records. These were in the subdivisional magistrates of office there. Um, one officer, Mr. Sohni, uh, sometime in mid-1950s or, or 1960s, um, is doing what all of us do. You know, my office is cluttered with a lot of paper. I need to get, I need to one, 
read my office of unnecessary paper, also know what kind of records there are. So in that process, he chances upon these records. And he sees um, testimony ke niche naam padte hain, Rajinder Prasad, Ram Navmi Prasad, Dharmidhar Prasad, M.K. Gandhi, and clearly the officer becomes aware of this of, of these importance. He contacted um, Rajinder Prasad, who then is the president of India, and said there is there are all these records. Uh, and, and, and Rajinder Prasad uh, says what we must do is that they must become part of the Indian Historical Record Association's records. So uh, an attempt is made to copy these. Nothing happens. But the originals are then handed over to Mrutinjai Prasad, uh, who is Babu Rajinder Prasad's son. Uh, and Babu Mrutinjai Prasad in 1973 deposited these as part of the Rajinder Prasad papers to the National Archives. So officially under the classification, these are part of the Rajinder Prasad papers. But since they were not personal papers of Rajinder Prasad or political papers of Rajinder Prasad, they, they came to be classified as bundles. So it formed bundle one to nine. But other things which were more comprehensible, straight Rajinder Prasad papers in the sense, letter written by Rajinder Prasad to Jawaharlal Nehru, letter written by Nehru to Rajinder Prasad, or records of you know, a state visit of Queen um, um, Elizabeth to Rashtrapati Bhavan and, and, and what transpired there, those would be seen as clearly official or personal records. Since these were fell outside of it, strict official papers or personal papers, they were classified as bundles. So that's what happened. So uh, a good officer trying to do spring cleaning, Rajinder Prasad who and Mrutinjai Prasad and the National Archives, four people, um, four agencies in that sense, created this um, record. Very interesting, very interesting. Now, following question is actually comes from the same thing. You mentioned that there will be approximately 10 volumes that uh, the project is targeting. One of which I believe would be introduction. Uh, I'm just presuming. Mm. How did you arrive at this number? Was it on the basis of the bundles that you referred just to? Bundles, just bundles, just, just bundles, just bundles. Um, when we opened the bundles and we counted the papers, they, 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 they each, I think each volume uh, of the size will have about 400 testimonies. And if we end up with 4,000 testimonies, then eight to 10 volumes is what we're looking at. Right? But uh, I don't know whether we will be able to do that. I mean, let, let me be honest about this, right? It, it's, um, 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 there are no resources available to do this kind of work. Um, um, it's non-funded. Um, um, so um, um, there is no um, assistance that is available um, to, to, to do the transcriptions, to do the typing, to do the annotations. All of these things happen. Uh, the copyrights remain between um, National Archives uh, and therefore all the royalties go to the National Archives for this work. And Navjeevan uh, uh, Trust is publishing them at a, at a, at a subsidized rate. Um, that's the, the whole idea. Uh, but, you know, um, 10 years, kisko pata? Um, um, you know, so we, we hope that in the next two years or so, we can set the frame for it. So other group of researchers, if they were to come up and, 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 and do the work, um, they can either discard the frame completely, editorial architecture of it, and reinvent it, or follow it. Um, I mean, that's not something that one can, but this is the way we make sense of it, and this is the way we would like it, it has made sense to us. Uh, this is the way we have arranged them. Um, um, you know, the testimonies happen, uh, are recorded as they appear in the folio. So if the first testimony is Lomraj Singh and the second one is Dhuni Rai, then first testimony is Lomraj Singh and the second is Dhuni Rai. So we've followed a certain kind of um, simple but a sensible design, we think. Um, um, so that's what we hope to do. Um, and um, don't know. I mean, I, I, 
बाजू में इतना दम है कि नहीं पता नहीं तो आई एम श्योर आई एम श्योर द प्रोजेक्ट विल फाइंड इट्स फ्रूटिशन एंड मतलब दिस विल बी अ ह्यूज रिसोर्स फॉर रिसर्चर्स फॉर सेवरल दैट्स व्हाट आई होप दैट्स व्हाट आई होप इज दैट्स व्हाट आई होप इज राइट सो एनी अदर क्वेश्चन दैट द ऑडियंस मे वांट टू आस्क प्लीज गो हेड रेज योर हैंड और अनम्यूट योरसेल्फ माधव प्लीज कंटिन्यू एम आई ऑडिबल सर यस Uh, sorry for asking so many questions, but uh, one last question which came to my mind. So you've been a scholar of the Gandhian intellectual tradition. Hmm. How, how do you see this project in terms of your own scholarly journey? You know, um, I think it's been very important. Um, it's been it's been very important. It's very rare um, in the life of. Um, of plodding through archives that you come across um material that has not been seen before not been worked before uh that you have uh, both the responsibility and the privilege of making it available uh to the community of fellow scholars uh and that um so it's i think that's fascinating and it's very important in my in case it has happened more than once that one has had this um responsibility great opportunity of of making available to fellow scholars uh, records which were hitherto unseen uh, or unpublished or or untranslated or un non annotated so whether it's the diaries of manu uh, which were not you know which are not even available in gujarati uh, and and not in been in the public domain uh, or these set of documents or the new work that um book that um, gopal krishna gandhi and i have done which should be released by month of april or yeah which are unpublished letters of gandhi and we think you know 100 volumes everything is covered and you come upon a tranche of very very important letters so it's been i think i have uh, um i've been you know i i i do th- i've learned to think of this as a, an act of grace and kindness um and um that's the only way i explain it um, um there is no um, explanation other than that um, as to why one should have this um opportunity responsibility uh, i i don't know Uh, but i do see this as 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 um as an act of grace that's the only way i understand it that's the only way it makes sense to me um and in and a completely non religious person uh, but that's the only language that's available to me thank you uh, any other question so if there are no more questions then maybe i i'm still waiting any other question if you want to ask from audience joining online okay then maybe it's time to say thank you to professor tridip it has been very rich and fascinating uh, the conversation i believe and uh, it's also the making the unmaking the making and the remaking of these testimonies uh, and i think it's interesting journey that the the letters the petitions the testimonies take i i personally think uh, there are multiple layers within which actually you can place the discovery of these testimonies therefore their comp- their compilation as well as the discovery and each of these actually tell an interesting story and therefore the compilation then in the publication form perhaps will tell us yet another story uh, for generation of historians to come and i thank you for uh, 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 for giving us time sharing your experiences and i'm sure that all of us uh, who joined here offline online must have uh, enriched themselves with these conversations so thank you very much once again uh, thank you thank you yogesh and you know um, this is the first time ever that i've spoken about the testimonies anywhere in the in excellent the- excellent um, great joy thank you very much and um um i do hope that you um have a look at the volume when it comes out and yes. and and uh, um, follow up with your questions and your searches through them thank you very much once the volume comes out in publication form soon then perhaps we will call you in shahid no, together shahid 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 
शाहिद का अंदाज बाया कुछ और है आप जानते हैं तो